This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a gastroenterologist talking to a patient called Martin Rush. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. So, Martin, you've been referred to me by your GP, and I've got your notes here. But first of all, perhaps you could tell me in your own words what's brought you here today. Well, it's a combination of things, really. I suspect they're all related. I've been getting really bad heartburn. It's quite extreme and always worse after I've eaten. Um, something else I've noticed is that I sometimes get bile in my mouth, which tastes revolting, and it probably makes my breath smell. It's absolutely disgusting. I seem to be belching and burping a lot too, and I'm full of gas or water or something. I feel bloated virtually all the time. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it often hurts when I'm swallowing. Something's not right, and it doesn't seem to be improving or going away. But quite the opposite. I can't get comfortable when I'm lying down, so it's affecting my sleep too. Any other symptoms, like uh, diarrhoea or sickness? No, nothing like that. And have you been taking anything? Well, I popped down to the local pharmacy and they gave me an antacid, right. so I've been taking that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to eat more fruits and vegetables. I've also made a really big effort to cut down on my alcohol consumption. I don't really know if that's going to help or not. And I find that going for a walk after dinner helps. That way I don't feel quite so bad when I go to bed. Well, it sounds like you've done the right thing in coming to see me. You do seem quite concerned. Well, I am worried. I mean, what if it's an ulcer or something? I would absolutely hate that. I can't stand the thought of not being able to eat properly. I love going out to eat in restaurants, and that would be the end of that, wouldn't it? Uh, not only that, but I don't want to lose a lot of weight and get thin. I've always been quite fit and strong, and the last thing I want is to go all weedy looking. And then there's my job. I work on a construction site and I don't want to have to ask my colleagues to do things for me or depend on them for anything. I'm a project manager, so I can't afford to take time off if I'm ill. Yeah, taking time off work would be a big problem for me. From what you've said, I don't think it'll come to that. Could you look into it, though? I mean, do some tests. I reckon that would give us a clue as to what's going on. I'm just worried I might need to have surgery. That'd be awful. I'd really hate that. OK, well, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. Could you just talk me through any major illnesses or accidents you've had in the past? Well, um, there's not much to report. Uh, when I was small, I had whooping cough. Then I went travelling around Central Asia four years ago and managed to get a bug, some food poisoning thing. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing was last year I was helping my friend move house. I slipped a disc. I felt my back go when we were picking up a heavy sofa. Right. And uh, one last question before I take a look at you about medication. Where are you with that? Well, I'm still on the blood pressure tablets my GP gave me three years ago, the Ramipril. That's the only medicine that I'm actually prescribed. 
otherwise I do tend to take a fair amount of ibuprofen because of the work I do mm. I get a very sore knee because I'm often working on all fours on pretty hard surfaces uh that's about it as far as medications concerned though okay well thank you for all that background that's really useful what we need to do now is uh... Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Sally Winter. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Sally, you've been referred to me by your GP, and I've got your notes here. Uh, first of all, though, I'd like to hear from you what's brought you here today. Uh, could you tell me how your problems began, what treatment you've had, and anything else you think I may need to know? Uh, well, it all started about five years ago. I began to notice a pain in my arm, and it's gradually got worse. Huh? It's a horrible type of pain, a sort of tingling like pins and needles going all the way down my right forearm from the elbow. It's the inside part that's particularly bad and it occasionally affects my little finger too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've had to come and see you because it's got to the point where I can't work. I cycle for a living. I'm a delivery cyclist and last weekend I noticed I was finding it hard to use the brakes and when I turn corners it's agony. I just can't seem to grip things properly. It's having quite a big impact on my life. Huh? I mean, all of the hundreds of little jobs I do every day that I never used to think about now seem almost impossible. This morning I had to ask my son to tie my shoelaces for me. Hmm. My wrist feels so weak. It's ruining everything. I see. Uh, so what have you been doing to manage the pain? Well, I went to see my GP. It must have been about a year ago now. He suggested using ice packs and to rest the arm, so that's what I did. And it did work up to a point, but it's gone beyond that now. Mm -hmm. So then this friend of mine said I should try CBD oil, as it's supposed to be amazing for that kind of pain, and it is the best thing I've found so far. Okay. But if I know I'm going to be doing a big job and I need my arm and hand to work properly, I take a Panadol beforehand. I see. Now, it says here on your notes that you went to see a chiropractor too. Uh, how did that go? Well, I only went once because it's expensive. <laughs> he gave me some funny exercises to do. I had to squeeze a tennis ball like this over and over. And the other thing he did was give me an elastic band and put it round my hand. Then I had to stretch it. Oh, and one more exercise where I had to lift a little weight up and down slowly. But it didn't help much, really. Hmm. To be honest, I stuck to it for about a week, and when nothing happened, I gave up because it felt like a waste of time. I see. Uh, is there anything else I need to know about? Any major illnesses or operations in the past? Uh, well, I had appendicitis when I was a kid, okay. and two years ago I went on a climbing holiday in Spain, and somehow I managed to pick up a shoulder injury there. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, nothing major. I've had a few bouts of depression over the past five years or so, like when a long-term relationship came to an end and then when my brother passed away. He had leukaemia. But I managed to pull round okay, because I'm very fit. I don't know many other women of my age who are in such good shape. And of course, I'm not overweight either. <laughs> no, you do look very well, Sally. What really worries me coming here is that it's all going to be a complete waste of time and totally ineffective. I mean, does physiotherapy even work? No offence, but I can't afford any more days off sick. If the problem's ongoing, you know, like a long-term thing, then I'm going to be in trouble. What I really want is steroid injections. Uh, well, a lot of people have doubts about physiotherapy, but I can assure you that it's an extremely powerful form of treatment, and you will see results if you commit to doing the exercises. Okay, 
but it'd be good if we could at least talk about some sort of surgery. My GP said I had to come and see you first. Uh, I, I don't think it'll even come to that. From what you've been saying, I'm confident that we'll be able to handle this with physiotherapy and over-the-counters. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Question 25. You hear a nurse talking to a patient whose six-month-old baby is having childhood immunizations. Now read the question. Thank you for bringing him today. So, he's having the 6-in-1 vaccination, which will protect him against six very serious diseases, whooping cough, tetanus, polio, hepatitis B, diphtheria, and haemophilus B. Mm -hmm. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to make it clear that there's no risk whatsoever of your baby contracting any of these diseases from the vaccination, mm -hmm. as it doesn't contain any live organisms. You may notice a few side effects, which could make him feel a bit irritable for a few days afterwards. There might be a slight red swelling or small bump at the injection site, and his temperature might be slightly higher than usual. If he develops a fever, keep him cool by giving him cold drinks and removing any heavy clothing. Mm -hmm. You should contact the doctor immediately if his temperature goes above 39 degrees. This is the first of three doses he'll be getting to ensure strong immunity. Each dose increases his immune response and he'll need all of them. OK. Question 26. You hear a pharmacist talking to a customer about an emergency contraceptive. Now read the question. You should take this as soon as possible. It might make you feel a little bit queasy, but if you're actually sick within three hours of taking it, you should go back to your doctor as you'll need another dose. Oh, really? How likely is that? It doesn't usually take much to upset my stomach, and I'm about to start a long shift. There's no way my manager will let me off to see a doctor. Well, if you're really worried, I can give you something over the counter, but you might still feel nauseous, and it'll probably make you a bit drowsy. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just have a coffee and take it easy. I can't risk throwing up, though. I don't want to have to take more time off for another appointment. It's really inconvenient. Question 27. You hear a practice manager talking to a physiotherapist who's about to carry out a home visit. Now read the question. Mrs Rumble hasn't come to any of her appointments so far, and we're not quite sure why. She needs acute therapy after her knee replacement, and we can't have her missing them. Anyway, we've agreed for her to have a few home visits first, and then, hopefully, after a while, she'll feel more positive about coming in. While you're there, maybe you can check her reasons for not wanting to come to the practice. Oh, and give her daughter a quick ring first to make sure they're both expecting you. There have been a lot of misunderstandings with these appointments. 
She also needs to sign these forms. If you could help her check the information's correct, I've already filled them out for her, but she needs to sign the bottom. When she's done them, can you bring them back here and give them to the receptionist? Question 28. You hear an occupational therapist talking to a patient who's recently suffered a stroke. Now read the question. So today we're going to be looking at how to improve your upper arm strength and I'm also going to show you some exercises which will help you increase the dexterity in your hands. Is there anything in particular that's causing you concern or discomfort? Uh, well, my left hand is the main problem. I feel like I can't rely on it. It's all weak and wobbly and sometimes it suddenly goes floppy or the muscles will go tight and start twitching and shaking about all on their own. Mm. There's nothing I can do about it can't grip things properly either and of course I need the other hand for my walking stick. I really don't want to end up having an accident because I've not been able to pick up a cup of tea or hold on properly to a stair rail or something like that. Mm -hmm. Question 29. You hear a GP talking to a patient at a community practice. Now read the question. So I understand that my 15-year-old daughter came to see you a few days ago. I don't want to snoop or betray her trust, but I would like to know what the rules or laws in England are regarding confidentiality. I mean, surely as her parent, I'm allowed to know what's going on. Well, under-16s are entitled to come and see us in confidence if they're believed to be competent enough to fully understand the situation. We don't disclose information, even if it's extremely sensitive, unless there's a grave risk of serious harm. But how am I supposed to look after her properly if she's really sick and hiding it from me for some reason? I'm not happy about this at all. I wonder why she's not telling me. We would always encourage a young adult to discuss issues with their parents, but in extreme cases, yes, the law does require us to report information in order to protect the patient. Question 30. You hear a senior nurse talking to the staff at a care home about the use of hoists. Now read the question. As you can see, we have hoists in all the bathrooms. They are complicated to use and potentially dangerous, so in order to avoid injuries, falls or any distress to patients, the correct protocol must be followed at all times when using this equipment. It's absolutely vital that a handling plan is completed for all patients who need to be moved using this type of equipment. It should detail all of the specific requirements, and by that I mean type of hoist, technique, number of trained handlers required, sling attachment loops to be used, and, where applicable, leg configurations. Everybody should go through this checklist with another member of staff every single time before using one, and nobody is to use one if they haven't attended the relevant course. This is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen.
Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with a bioengineer called Mark Kendall, who's developed a new method of administering vaccinations called a nanopatch. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Today I'm with biomedical engineer Mark Kendall who's developed new technology called a nano patch for delivering vaccinations. Mark, why is this new innovation necessary? The needle and syringe method is more than 160 years old. It has made a huge contribution to increasing life expectancy, but we can still do better. Mm -hmm. The needle itself causes all sorts of problems. It's estimated that up to 20% of patients in Australia have a phobia of needles and don't get vaccinated against deadly diseases. This means that herd immunity is lowered and people are more susceptible to fatal or life-changing diseases. Not only that, but infections caused by needles are thought to contribute to as many as 1.3 million deaths per year worldwide. So what exactly is the nano patch and why does it work so well? It's a very small patch, one square centimetre, and it weighs very little. Each one has approximately 20,000 little points, or projections as we call them, on it. It's invisible to the naked eye and covered and sealed with a powder form of the vaccine. It's applied using a reusable spring-operated device, which releases the vaccine less than a minute after it breaks through the tough outer layer of skin and contacts the moisture within it. Afterwards, the patch can be thrown away. It's very effective because the skin contains huge quantities of immune cells. A needle targets muscle, which contains very few. Mm -hmm. Could you outline the main benefits? Well, the main one is improved immune responses. Vaccines work by introducing an antigen into the body. This is a safe kind of germ that makes our body think it needs to deliver an immune response so it learns and remembers how to cope with threats. When the real threat, in other words a disease, arrives, the body can deal with it and eliminate the infection. Now certain layers of the skin are jammed full of immune cells and the nanopatch is able to reach thousands and thousands of them within a microscopic area. When my team tested responses to the flu vaccine, they found that a nanopatch required a far lower quantity of the actual vaccine for it to be effective. And what impact would that have in terms of global health? Well, if we can take a vaccine that's currently $10 down to $0.10, cents, it would be a real game-changer for the developing world, mm. simply because it could significantly decrease financial obstacles and be delivered on a far larger scale. It also means that we may be able to develop vaccines which protect against more deadly infections. When we consider the big three... HIV, malaria and tuberculosis, which cause more than 7 million deaths per year, there are currently no effective vaccinations for any of them.
I assume that being small must make transporting nano patches easier. I mean, they must be far easier to transport than a needle and syringe. Ah, oh, yes. Of course, it's far easier to carry hundreds or thousands of tiny, lightweight nano patches at a time than it is to transport needles or syringes. Mm. A car, bike, or van isn't always necessary to manage the load. This means we can deliver vaccines far more easily to people in remote areas, and these people often slip through the net. But it's not only the size; the requirement to keep a needle and syringe vaccine refrigerated all the way through from production to when it's administered is known as the cold chain. And as you can imagine, it presents huge logistical challenges in certain parts of the world. If the vaccine is too cold or too warm, it breaks down and is unusable. It's estimated that as many as half the vaccines in Africa aren't working properly due to a breakdown in this system. Because the nano patch is dry rather than being a liquid, the cold chain isn't necessary.、Uh, why did you decide to trial the nano patch in Papua New Guinea? Well, Papua New Guinea struggles with a lot of the key obstacles to vaccination and reflects the medical and climatic conditions of much of the developing world.、Mm. There's the logistics, for example.、Uh, Papua New Guinea has only 800 suitable refrigerators, and many of these are old, in disrepair, or in the wrong locations. Not only that, but the country has unstable energy provision, which makes refrigeration even more difficult. But our main reason for trialing the nano patch there was that the country has the highest incidence in the world of young women with the human papilloma virus, or HPV, as it's known. This is one of the leading causes of cervical cancer. Yet the vaccine is unavailable because it's too expensive. Now look at extract two. Extract two, questions thirty-seven to forty-two. You hear a practice nurse called Bruce Wilkins giving a presentation about a project aimed at delaying the onset of dementia amongst older patients. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-seven to forty-two. I'm here today to talk about a new project at our practice, which we hope will delay or even prevent the onset of dementia in our patients. Dementia is on track to be the deadliest disease of the century, and globally it poses the greatest health care and social challenges. A recent study revealed that preserving and improving brain health throughout life could reduce the number of cases by up to 35%. And it was this that prompted us to try something different. The research identified nine potentially modifiable health and lifestyle factors, which can increase or reduce risk. We've decided to take this on board and roll out an inexpensive, small-scale, and very simple project. 
The starting point was to get as many patients as possible to go for a test with an audiologist. Listening to the radio, watching television and picking up meaning in a conversation provide access to a cognitively rich environment. This helps to build something called cognitive reserve, where the brain strengthens its networks and makes it more resilient to deterioration in later life. This explains why the most important risk factor for dementia is having a hearing loss after the age of 45. So, we sent all of our patients over this age a text message giving them information about where they could find a local audiologist. GPs follow this up at their next appointment and discuss the outcome. It turned out that quite a few patients had been struggling with hearing aids. So one of our receptionists was trained to solve technical problems and she helps them get back on track. The study showed that learning new skills throughout life also builds cognitive reserve. Certain activities have been found to offer particularly effective protection because they form and strengthen brain synapses. And I'm convinced that the most efficient two are learning a foreign language, or a musical instrument. So the second thing we did was set up two free learning groups for anyone over the age of 45. We asked patients to suggest what they'd most like to learn and then worked out what we could realistically offer at a minimal cost and we've ended up with guitar and French lessons. They're very popular and sparked demand for other groups such as a book club and a model airplane building group. My favourite part of the project is the activity groups run by an ex-GP called George. He's recognised that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. The combined risk factor for dementia of physical inactivity, obesity and hypertension was 9%. George is a very keen walker and organises a group which meets twice a week to walk through the beautiful countryside we are lucky enough to have on our doorstep. The group is very well attended and has revealed many more benefits than we originally anticipated. Not only will it hopefully produce helpful results in terms of physical health, but it's leading to stronger friendships, meaning that those who take part are less susceptible to depression and social isolation, which are also risk factors. That's what I love most about these groups. The benefits are multidimensional. So that's where we are with the project at the moment, but it's forever evolving. We've been contacted by other local practices who are interested in setting up similar schemes and hope that in the future we'll be able to work together in terms of sharing good practice, offering a wider range of groups and building attendance. The next thing on our list is to reduce the number of smokers at our practice. This would lead to huge benefits across the board, so finding an alternative to the usual cessation groups, which are very poorly attended, would be a game-changer, not only financially, but practically too. Ultimately, I'd like to see ideas like ours being shared more freely at a national level. We could be missing out on opportunities that would make a huge difference. You may be thinking that the outcomes of our project are unlikely to be dramatic and the findings of the study are unlikely to be replicated exactly, but because we see the far-reaching effects and terrible strain the disease puts on family, carers and the health service, we believe that even the smallest improvement would significantly benefit our community and potentially our society as a whole. There's nothing to lose and so far participants have only gained in terms of new skills and friendships. I think the findings revealed in the study tell us it's time we change the way we tackle dementia, or at least try. Otherwise, we risk allowing dementia to shape our society and the course of our lives. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.